Last Eve, Mystery of Sanctification, Book One, by Shan Lu. Chapter Five, Submission to Church Authority. I would understand that for some, the assertion of Christ's headship over individual believers may sound novel. And may seem at odds with the traditional understanding of submission to church authority. Here, I would like to share my personal revelation on submission to church authority. In the Greek New Testament, the Greek word commonly used for submit is hupotasso, including the situations where believers submit to God, wives to husbands. Children to parents, citizens to governing authorities, bond servants to masters, less mature believers to more mature believers, believers to those devoted to the service of the saints and to every fellow worker and the labourer, and believers to one another. The Greek word commonly used for obey is hupakou, which, compared with hupotasso. Also implies compliance. It is used to express the required obedience from believers to God, wives to husbands, children to parents, bond servants to masters, and believers to spiritual authority. The most frequently quoted Bible verse for supporting and legitimizing the requirement that believers submit to church authority in a legalistic manner. Is Hebrews thirteen seventeen, which commonly translates as "obey your leaders" and "submit to them." However, the Greek word used here for "submit" is "hupiko," a deviation from "hupotasso" that is used elsewhere to convey the concept of submission, and it occurs only once in the entire Greek New Testament. According to Thayer's Greek lexicon, "hupiko" means to resist no longer, but to give way, yield properly of competence, metaphorically, to yield to authority, and admonition, to submit. Meanwhile, in the same verse, the Greek word used for "obey" is "pitho," instead of "hupaku," that is used elsewhere. To convey the concept of obedience, according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, pitho means to persuade, be persuaded of what is trustworthy. Therefore, based on the overall definitions of the two Greek verbs, perhaps Hebrews thirteen seventeen should have been more accurately translated as. Be persuaded by your leaders, and yield to them, which is more of an exhortation to believers not to be belligerent, unteachable. For those who rule over us, watch out for our souls, as those who will one day give an account for us before the Lord, as the rest of the verse says. Hence. Using Hebrews thirteen seventeen to justify or condone exercising headship or lording it over by church leaders is untenable. As mentioned in the last chapter, the introduction of the new covenant brought about a required change in the way God's people were to be governed, as opposed to the kind of governance. Often seen in the world, where one lords it over another through positional authority, under the new covenant, the government of Christ in the kingdom is in the realm of the spirit, and is reflected in the natural as a servanthood type of leadership. Jesus said to the disciples, "You know that the ruler of the Gentiles lorded over them." And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, 
even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Not only so, Jesus himself demonstrated it by washing the disciples' feet, saying, "You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also." Ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In a corporate structure. Or the episcopal polity, which is the Old Testament model of governance, tacitly, the man at the top is the ceiling in terms of spiritual advancement. For in order to maintain his position and the legitimacy of his leadership, in theory, no one is supposed to go above him. In comparison, in a servanthood leadership. Bearing great spiritual maturity and authority in the kingdom, in the realm of the spirit, one leads by example, and influences from the bottom, regardless of whether he holds a position in the natural or not. He willingly functions as a stepping stone or the shoulders others can stand on, in order to help others grow in maturity. And walk into their destinies in God, desiring to see others exceed Him in spiritual advancement. Besides, in a corporate structure, people look up to and rely on the man at the top, and therefore place great performance pressure on him, who, like any of us, is a mere human, whilst the heart of a servanthood leadership. Is continually pointing others to the Lord Jesus, instead of drawing others to oneself. Here, we're actually touching on two different types of church authority: positional authority and spiritual authority. Since the inception of the church, the nature of church authority has undergone significant changes. Christian centers or bishoprics started to form during the Apostolic Age, with James, the Lord's brother, being the first bishop of Jerusalem, Peter the first bishop of Antioch, Paul and Peter the first joint bishop of Rome, and Mark the evangelist, the first bishop of Alexandria. Moreover, before the issuance of the Edict. Of Milan, by Constantine and Licinius in 313. In the first 300 years, the Church faced great persecutions from Jews, pagans, and most of all the totalitarian Roman state, from confiscation of property to exile to imprisonment to execution by sword, griddle, pyre, and wild beasts. Countless Christians suffered gruesome tortures and met the end of martyrdom, men and women alike, young and old alike. In the same period, the Church also had to fight rampant heresies within and paganism, Greek philosophies without. Amidst such a hostile environment and turbulent time, apostolic succession. Was thus implemented to ensure that orthodox doctrines can be passed down to posterity. Also, the Lord raised a spiritual leadership to be a stabilizing force in the church to bring wisdom and strength to believers, men who lived righteous and holy lives, who were heresy detesting, uncompromising, and vigilant. Who were prepared to be martyred for Christ at any time. Over time, these men's spiritual authority 
was recognized by those around them, and they rose to ecclesiastical positions such as bishops. By the time Christianity was accepted by the Roman Empire, the Church had been more or less purged of false believers, false doctrines, and its canon confirmed, creed formed, theology developed. It was time to spread and expand. Riding on the official sanction, and power and resources granted by the state, I can imagine that, with a newfound freedom and favor, the church was only too eager, too ambitious to firm her footing, and establish her presence within the empire, earnestly seeking to maximize the spreading of the Christian faith. Such excitement. Arguably, might have overshadowed, and therefore caused the church to overlook some of the side effects of the marrying of the church and the state that she later was proved to be less prepared for, among which were the interference of the state in ecclesiastical affairs, replacing personal conviction and devotion to Christ. With legalistic organized religion enforced by both church authority and the state, and the complacency and corruption creeping into the clergy on account of power and prestige, yet, despite these, the church managed to navigate through the ebb and flow of history of the next twelve hundred years, by God's grace and her stewardship. Christianity grew from a persecuted sect originated from the Holy Land to an established religion over the whole Europe, commanding respect and submission from even the heads of the nations. Nevertheless, the outstanding issues such as those mentioned above increasingly took a toll on the Church. And eventually culminated in the advent of the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century. In particular, it may be said that one of the key underlying causes was that some of the ecclesiastical officials inherited the positions along with the associated powers, yet failed to live up to the standards of virtue of their predecessors. The aforesaid spiritual leadership in the early church, who merged out of the persecution fire. Essentially, there occurred a separation and thus a differentiation between positional authority and the spiritual authority in the church, leading to sometimes a mismatch between the two, which arguably can still be observed in the present day. When speaking about church authority, usually it is positional authority that people are referring to, as it is the more recognizable of the two. An ecclesiastical position inherently has authority attached to it, and that authority is granted by the religious organization it belongs to, an institution set up by man. And its level of authority depends on where in the hierarchy of organization man places it. This means, the authority of an ecclesiastical position cannot be exercised outside the jurisdiction of the religious organization where the position lies. Meanwhile, positional authority is fully transferable, in that. Whoever succeeds a position also succeeds its attached authority, regardless of the person's own virtues. In other words, positional authority lies with the position, not the person who fills the position. The implication of such is that, for example, prior to the Reformation, some of the clerics in the church conducted their lives. Just like those in the world, yet they could still exercise positional authority over believers. Spiritual authority, on the other hand, lies with the person who may or may not 
hold an ecclesiastical position in the natural. Part of the spiritual authority a person carries is warranted by the extent and the depth of sanctification he has undergone, and the spiritual battles he has fought and won. And part of it is determined by what the Lord sovereignly bestows on him for the work of ministry. This means the specific areas in which one has spiritual authority, and the degree to which they do, are spiritually objective. They are not subject to man's interpretation nor manipulation. In addition to the aforementioned early church leaders who endured a severe persecution fire, the apostle Paul, for instance, also carried a great spiritual authority. For as to sanctification, he lived a totally crucified life. As to spiritual battles, he fought against the beasts, that is, principalities. And as to sovereignly delegated authority, he was entrusted with special authority by the Lord for his ministry, which has been impacting the church even to this day. While warning those unrepentant among the Corinthian church, who doubted his authority, he wrote, "For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up, and not for tearing down." Unlike positional authority. Spiritual authority can be exercised anywhere the Lord sends the person, and its transferability is conditional on the person being received. If we recognize the spiritual authority a person carries, and receive and honor that person, we would then be able to glean from that person and therefore grow in the same areas of influence that person operates in. As Jesus said, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. As to those leaders in the early church, it may be said that they first had a significant amount of spiritual authority on account of their righteous walk and severe refinement. As well as the sovereign confirmment of the Lord, and then they correspondingly had a positional authority added in the natural, as they stepped into ecclesiastical positions. However, as their bishoprics were passed down as part of the church tradition, from reading church history, it seems the vital importance of spiritual authority gradually became overlooked. In the church, such that positional authority simply became synonymous with church authority. Before heeding the call of the Lord to serve Him full time, as part of my professional career, I worked in human resource management at the headquarters of a Chinese commercial bank, specifically in headcounting and recruiting. Due to such experience. I often draw a parallel between the church authority conundrum above and a work challenge that I used to face back there, revolving around the design and improvement of the organizational structure and positions of our firm. There was a constant debate between the position-oriented approach and the person-oriented approach. Do we create a position first, based on business and organizational analysis, and then recruit the person who best fits the role, or do we bring on a competent talent first, and then create a position for him? Her HR division favored the former, because from the back office perspective, it was more systematic, methodological, and more necessary for oversight. To keep the firm's overall human resource cost under control, whereas the business divisions favoured the latter, 
because from the front office perspective, it was more practical, flexible, and more able to accommodate immediate business needs. During those years, I was often caught in heated debates, even head-to-head -head confrontations with various representatives from the business divisions, not only needing the grace and boldness from the Lord, but also sometimes finding myself desperately trying to borrow that extra oomph from my three-inch heels. Working for the Human Resource Department, I had an obligation to stand by the HR policy of the firm, but I was also required to empathize with our counterparts, who contended for extra human resources, which they often believed to be the key missing ingredients in order for their parts of the business to succeed. Subject to the stance and approval of senior management. At times, I had to dig my heels in and contest their requests, because oftentimes they were so preoccupied with the interests of their own divisions that they overlooked the overall interests of the firm. At other times, it was necessary to yield to them because their divisions had genuine needs, and meeting those needs would benefit the business as a whole. For I understand that the organizational structure, along with its positions, needed to have the flexibility to adapt to the ever-changing business environment. From doing some research and speaking to others in the HR industry, I found out that which approach is favored really varies from corporation to corporation, depending on the nature of the business. The company culture and the management preference, etc. But when it comes to the kingdom, I think we need both. We cannot build the house of the Lord haphazardly, solely being driven by individuals' callings or particular passions towards certain aspects of the Christian ministry. We need a structure, and different offices and functions therein. The position-oriented approach. In the meantime, because the church is the people, needless to say, our arms are always wide open to anyone who wishes to join God's household. And as believers grow, mature through discipleship, their gifting and calling will gradually make room for them and define their individual roles and functions in the church. The person-oriented approach. The fundamental key is: we need to allow the Holy Spirit to direct us and help us organize the church in the natural, based on the spiritual reality. That is, determining and maintaining ecclesiastical positions and appointing people to those positions according to what the Spirit shows us, in terms of whom. Where they are at maturity-wise, what offices or and gifting they have, how they function in the spirit, etc., so that those wielding positional authority in the natural are the same people carrying corresponding levels of spiritual authority in the realm of the spirit, like in the early church, or at least there is a strong positive correlation between the two. Conversely. Organizing ecclesiastical positions in the church based on human wisdom, according to how things appear in the natural, is likely to result in a mismatch of reality, of what is in the spirit and what is in the natural. Furthermore, having fallen short of the glory of God, we humans have an ever-present need to maintain a sense of security. And therefore, tend to stick to what we know, conventions. And over time, we have developed a dogmatic tendency. Yet, the revelation of Jesus is always expanding. The Holy Spirit is always moving. The spiritual realm is very dynamic. Rather than clinging on to human rules and traditions, the church can only rely on the Lord's leading for its continual survival and thrival. 
What has always been is not always true. What has worked in the past does not necessarily work every time, and what has arisen to serve a specific purpose at a specific time does not warrant perennial existence. The Lord does not only have entry strategies, but also exit strategies, meaning a ministry. Or a ministerial position sometimes is not meant to last forever, for no matter how valid, how legitimate at the time it came, once it has accomplished its kingdom purpose, it is time for it to exit, and its people disbanded, who may be regrouped later for other assignments of God. The body of Christ needs to be mobile, flexible, and attentive to the Lord's leading at all times. Whereas positional authority is obvious, it is not as easy to recognize spiritual authority, since it is in the realm of the unseen. Yet we have not been left without a clue. This takes us back to the issue we were discussing earlier: church governance. More specifically, the Old Testament model versus the New Testament model of governance, as shared previously, the Old Testament model is one man governing at the top through a chain of command. This is effectively achieved through the exercising of various levels of positional authority within a religious organization. Whilst the New Testament model is a servanthood type of leadership, leading, serving, and influencing others from the bottom, in a servanthood leadership, often the greater one's kingdom stature in the spirit, the lowlier one appears in the natural. For example, in terms of the order of importance of functions in the body, the Bible says. That God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, but when it comes to spiritual stamina, the Bible says that the house of the Lord is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, meaning that. Although those genuinely walking these two offices carry great spiritual authority and maturity, they position themselves at the lowest, together with the Lord Jesus, who came not to be served but to serve, holding the weight of the house of the Lord at the bottom. The Apostle Paul is an example, though being the spiritual giant in the kingdom. He said that he was the very least of all the saints, and that God had exhibited him along with other apostles as last of all, pouring out his heart before the Corinthians. He wrote, "What we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience, in terms of spiritual stature in the realm of the unseen." We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Highlighting the contrast between what appears in the natural and what actually is in the spirit, he continued, "We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown." And yet, well known, as dying, and behold, we live; as punished, and yet not killed; as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing; as poor, yet making many rich; as having nothing, yet possessing everything. It can be said that recognizing spiritual authority was a journey of learning for Nicodemus. Who himself, as a Pharisee, ruler of the Jews and the teacher of Israel, held positional authority. He recognized that God was with Jesus, so he humbled himself and came to him by night. And Jesus taught him the difference between that which is of the flesh in the natural and that which is of the spirit. 
Later, when his fellow Pharisees sought to arrest Jesus because he was drawing people away and were afraid that those of the authorities and of the Pharisees had also believed in him, Nicodemus spoke up in Jesus' favor despite facing hostility from his colleagues. It is not unreasonable to assume that there, Nicodemus saw the difference between someone who tried to exercise power and control through positional authority, and someone who walked in great spiritual authority yet in love and humility. In the end, while the disciples had fled and Peter denied the Lord three times, it was Joseph of Arimathea. A member of the Sanhedrin who came to Pilate asking for Jesus' crucified body, Nicodemus also came with spices, and together they buried him. It may be inferred that by then Nicodemus had recognized who Jesus really was in the spirit, and willingly submitted to his authority. Concerning the centurion who firmly believed in Jesus' spiritual authority, Jesus marvelled and said to those who followed him, "Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith." Having distinguished and discerned between positional authority and spiritual authority in our church life, we can then submit more accurately. Neither subjecting ourselves to false yokes, nor failing to submit to church authority, without undermining Christ's headship, with positional authority, we honor and submit to them in the Lord, for ultimately there is no authority except from God. With those carrying great spiritual authority, not only do we honor and submit to them, but sometimes. It is also necessary that we receive them with fear and trembling, because they are ambassadors for Christ, speaking and working under the direction and on the authority of the Lord, and their words and works impact us significantly, whether in the spirit or later manifesting in the natural, whether individually or corporately. Whilst in any circumstances. We do not want to come under the control of man simply on account of their positional authority. We also need to be careful not to go into independence or rebellion, which is easy to do under the influence of the spirit of the world, especially for those who have been hurt or abused by those in ecclesiastical positions in the past. While we all hope that the representation of the church on earth is a holy place of ethereal perfection and beauty, until she is fully sanctified, unfortunately, we come across sad stories that we ourselves sometimes are part of. It always grieves me whenever I see on the news or hear from fellow Christians about the injustice. Individuals have suffered to various degrees at hands of church leaders. Without condoning it, I am, on the other hand, also concerned about the aftermath of such, which I have sometimes observed among believers, and that is, in the absence of walking through forgiveness and healing. The trauma from the past can cause a victim to be repelled by the notion of submission to church authority of any sort. This can be further exacerbated by the prevalent worldly ethos of equality, which believers in the West, in general, are more exposed to, and which, if care is not taken, can lure us into discarding. And therefore, disobeying God's commandment regarding submission to authority altogether. In the kingdom, whilst we are all equal in that we are all unconditionally loved and accepted by God in Jesus Christ, and that He has assigned a calling and destiny to each of us, we are not all equal in the extent 
to which we have been through the sanctification process, and grown in maturity and authority, and worked into our callings and destinies. These are affected by the degrees of our willingness to cooperate with God, and the choices we make in our Christian walks. Neither are the sizes of our callings or levels of spiritual authority sovereignly given by the Lord all equal. The Bible says that there are leaders of thousands and of hundreds, of fifties and of tens, and that some are entrusted with five talents, some with two, and some with one. If we are of dust and clay, then God is the master potter. And in pottery, it takes processes such as grinding, molding, trimming, drying, glazing, and most importantly, rounds of intense firing in order for a vessel to become beautiful, presentable, and ready for use. As individual believers, we are at different stages of preparation for the different purposes we are designed for. Be it being trimmed off of excessive pride, or left in the wilderness to dry, or glazed with new gifting, or put through the fire of testing. In Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty to twenty-one, Paul wrote, "In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, and some for dishonor." Therefore, if any one cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. This means a part of the spiritual authority that can be grown into for the works of the kingdom is conditional on ourselves as believers, i.e. A resolve to continually pursue righteousness and holiness, and persevere in the spiritual battles ordained for us. Meanwhile, to demonstrate God's sovereign choice, Paul also wrote in Romans chapter nine, verse twenty to twenty-one. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is moulded say to its moulder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honourable use and another for dishonourable use? Now, this is the part of the spiritual authority that is not because of works, but because of Him who calls. So, in the spirit, there is indeed a hierarchy of maturity and authority. And we are exhorted by the Word of God to submit to those more mature than us, and obey those with great spiritual authority. Nevertheless, even one with great spiritual authority cannot infringe on Christ's headship over another believer, for the reasons I have already explained in the last chapter. Thank you for listening. I hope you've been blessed. For more information, please visit www.mysteryofsanctification.com for the full content of the book, including biblical references. You can purchase the book on Amazon by searching "Last Eve Shanlu." Thank you.